with great joy and immense exultation, I, Soumya Bajpayee, feel privileged to extend my warm welcome to all present here to a webinar on innovation, incubation, and e-knowledge markets. We at Ferguson en envisage an Atmanirbhar Bharat, wherein as we as a nation will be able to enhance our contribution to the global economy. This was made possible only through the promotion of entrepreneurship development and a visionary mindset by a respected principal, sir. So without further ado, I would like to invite our principal, sir, Dr. Ravindra Singh Pardeshi for the welcome address. Good evening, one and all, honorable chairman, council and governing body of Deccan Education Society, Dr. Sharad Kunte, Vice Chairman Sri Mahesh Athole, Dr. Shikha Jain, Director IMDR, and today's speaker, uh, Raj Hirwani, who has, I mean, of course, uh, uh, pleasure to invite you for this particular function because uh, he, uh, I mean, the Dr. P.C. Sejwalkar, Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. So this, uh, I mean, he's a right person, I would say, because he's alumnus of Ferguson and then IMDR. He's a student of uh, Sheshwalkar, sir. And that is how, uh, and his work, especially in the field of uh, uh, the uh, uh, National Chemical Laboratories or as a now presently Professor Emeritus of Academic uh, Scientific Industrial Research. So definitely, uh, your guidance, your uh, uh, expertise definitely would help us all because we were looking forward today to hold this particular program in amphitheater. But however, the situation uh, has uh, uh, forced us to conduct this online. And nonetheless, our students as a Ferguson College has become now autonomous. And therefore, we are trying to have all these uh, kind of uh, uh, opportunities to the students. In fact, on 12th of January, we conducted the innovation program. More than uh, 56, 57 students uh, uh, participated that. Every year, we conduct this activity. And that is how we are trying to go for the startups or innovation. And that is how the society has helped us, has supported us with uh, uh, combinedly Ferguson College and IMDR. We are uh, starting the center that is Dr. P.C. Sejwalkar Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. And also we are trying to get some funding support from the Department of Science and Technology under Ministry of Science and Technology. So indeed, it is a great pleasure, sir, to invite you. And uh, I am very thankful that you have kindly consented to be uh, today's speaker. And uh, uh, our students, of course, from both uh, Ferguson College as well as IMDR, they would be benefited. And we look forward in future that you would be visiting your alma mater and guide our students. With uh, these few words, I conclude. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Sharad Kunte, sir, Chairman of Government, Governing Body and Council, Deccan Education Society, for the opening remark. Thank you. Welcome, all of you. The Deccan Education Society is a leading organization in the field of education founded by Lokumanya Tilak. We are rigorously working for 140 years to fulfill the expectations expressed by the society. In the early days, by imparting the national education, this educational institute worked to create the self-esteem among the youth of the society regarding indigenous industries, languages, as well as their culture and traditions. Ferguson College has consistently worked for worked to mobilize young people to fight against the British rule. The then Home Minister and Mumbai State Governor Hudson was shot in Ferguson's library for firing indiscriminately at several innocent citizens in the martial law implemented in Solapur. And the perpetrator was Vasudev Gokte, a student of Ferguson College. Swadhandravir Savarkar was a student of Ferguson College who ignited the flame 
of revolution in the youth for the independence of the country. The needs of the society changed when the country got independence. Now, the expectation from the educational institutions is that they should produce leading youth in all walks of life. Accordingly, the Deccan Education Society has created thousands of youth leading the society in politics, economics, industry, arts, education and health. Two former Prime Ministers of India, Sri Narasimh Varao and V.P. Singh, were the alumni of Ferguson College. Today, many high-ranking officials in the central and state governments are alumni of this college. Today, Ferguson's alumni are doing research or working as professors at reputed universities around the world. It's now 75 years since independence. Large-scale changes are taking place in the society. India is on track to become a $5 trillion economy. In such a scenario, the main challenge facing India is to eradicate poverty here. For this, first of all, employment generation initiatives should be given a boost. Today, society is looking at educational institutions with this expectations. The Deccan Education Society has accepted the challenge of meeting this expectation of the society. In the next five years, we will create a situation where not a single student who has passed out of this society will be unemployed. Either because of the excellent quality, he will easily get the good job or he will start his own business and will provide employment to many other unemployed youths. This is the first innovation incubation center to be started by Ferguson College and a reputed management college like IMDR to motivate the youth in the industry. Dr. Shezwalkar, the founder director of IMDR, was known as management guru. Thousands of students who passed out of IMDR under his guidance have today reached great heights in the industry. On the occasion of the birth anniversary of Dr. Shezwalkar, IMDR College has undertaken such a major constructive work of which the alumni of IMDR as well as the Deccan Education Society are very proud. All these alumni of IMDR are ready to support the Innovation and Incubation Center started by this organization. Through the collaboration of these alumni, the enthusiastic professors of Ferguson College and IMDR College and the students who are determined to change their future, this Innovation Incubation Center will set an example for the education sector in Maharashtra. I warmly welcome Dr. Raj Hirwani, who has arrived to guide us in this program. Working in the National Research Institute of NCL and DRDO, Mr. Hirwani has left an indelible mark on his efficiency. The guidance he provides at the inauguration of this Innovation and Incubation Center will surely inspire all of us along the way. Thanks, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now, I feel really privileged that I was given the responsibility to introduce our guest lecturer for today, Dr. Raj Hirwani, sir. And I'm really proud, proud to announce that he is an illustrious alumnus of Ferguson College as well as IMDR College. Dr. Raj Hirwani, sir, has nearly 40 years of techno-commercial experience in research and industry. Currently, he is working as an emeritus pro professor at the Academy of Scientific and Innovative Research, adjunct professor at DS Center for Entrepreneurship. He was head of intellectual property 
directorate in CSIR and director of CSIR's unit for research and development of information products at Pune. Uridip is responsible for knowledge and IPR management for major national CSIR programs and provides services to clients in public, public as well as private sector. Prior to his stint at Urdip, Dr. Hirwani was head of research planning and business development division at National Chemical Laboratory, Pune, where he was involved with pre-research appraisals and techno-economic evaluation of projects, IPR management, technology transfer, and business development. He coordinated World Bank, for, World Bank funded technology institution support services programs at NCL. So without any delay, I would like to invite Dr. Raj Hirwani sir to enlighten us about innovation incubation and e-knowledge markets. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. At the outset, I'd like to thank Dr. Kunte, Dr. Athole, Professor Pradeshi, Professor Jain, and Professor Katharka for inviting me to today's event. I feel honored by this invitation. As you heard, I am alumnus of Ferguson College as well as IMDF. I spent six years of my youth on that campus, and I have wonderful memories which I like to relive. We had wonderful professors in all the departments, whether it was botany with Professor Majumdar, zoology, Professor Karakar, chemistry, Professor Patek, mathematics, Professor Chobel, physics, Professor Pantambekar. Apart from academic activities, we have other wonderful memories, including Ferguson Canteen, which used to offer us Banwada rather than the Vada Pao 50 years back. Recreation Hall, where I learned chess. Hobby workshop behind physics department, where I indulged in electronics. And there's a temple of learning on the campus, which is very underutilized. There is a library. I know with the internet, less and less people may be going there. But if you go there, 100 years old journals, there are treasure there. Maybe there is some other occasion where I like to share those memories including Professor Shajalkar, I'd like to pay my tributes in. Because at that time when we got admission, after the written exam, you had a group discussion, you had a meeting with the committee, and finally, Professor Shajalkar used to meet each candidate and question him. And I remember he telling me the lack of <laughs> service background, why I want to get into management, why not technical things. And I told him I want to be an entrepreneur. I became actually an entrepreneur rather than an entrepreneur. Wonderful memories of those years. And whatever I'm there today, let me tell you. Ferguson College and IMDR have shaped my career. The way it has taken turns is all because of the things which happened at these two institutions. So I owe my gratitude to both the institutions and the professors who taught us. I got into R&D management function, having worked at the CSIR and other institutions, and I continue to teach and mentor students in IIT system. But today I thought I will talk about mixed subject of innovation, incubation, and e-knowledge markets, which is relevant to today's event. So let me share my presentation with you. Are you able to see my screen? Hello. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. When we talk about innovation, innovation is the latest buzzword. When I began my career, it was R&D. R&D management was a topic. Then it became technology, technology management. And today it is innovation management. 
actually most widely read industry journal itself was known as R&D Management Journal. It became Research and Technology Management Journal. And now it has become innovation. So let us look at what do we understand by innovation. There is a transformation or an application of knowledge to a novel and useful aim. Knowledge gets generated in academic institutions, in research institutions. But that application of that knowledge, something which is useful to society, that is what innovation is. So it is that integration of the utilitarian element and exploitation of either with newly discovered knowledge or established source of knowledge. It's called innovation. Innovation that does not make money is merely an invention. So obviously, innovation has to generate funds, wealth. And this is where I remember our management guru, Peter Drucker, who defined innovation saying, is the means by which a person creates new wealth, producing resources, or endows existing resources with enhanced potential for creating wealth. He was the first management group who talked about wealth creation, and he defined the job of entrepreneur as a wealth creator. So let us look, what are the key components of innovation? One is a strong technology base, which comes from academic institutions, research institutions, and also from the in-house R&D of industrial sector. Then comes market intelligence. You must understand existing markets, customer needs. And very often, since you'll come up with new technology which did not exist, you produce new products, you should be able to anticipate future markets. Markets which are latent which consumers have never articulated. And then teams with multiple skills. Because today, every technology is a multi, every product is a multi-technology product. It goes beyond the skill of an individual. You require a team, their creativity, and then you must synergize their energy with their abilities. Now, let us go back to the traditional role of institutions. Do education. The creation of human capital is our foremost responsibility. But we also do research. So accumulation of that basic knowledge, creation of a new basic knowledge, what we call as a pure science, is in another traditional role. And as we have evolved, we have been told to apply that knowledge to create new products and processes. Having created new products and processes, we must transfer that to the product to enterprises so that they can be mass produced and be made available to the society. Now, when we look at industry, industrial R&D, there are certain challenges. One, markets have become global. Whole business is global. There are no longer geographical boundaries. So there's a global competitive pressure. So no longer companies are competing within the Indian market with other Indian companies, but with the global companies. Tata Motors has to compete with Hyundai, to compete with other com automobile companies, Ford, General Motors. And since the markets are global, you also require a global presence because Markets are becoming homogeneous. No longer an Indian customer wants to wait for a new product which comes. So you need to globally launch the products. So Microsoft launched a new version of Windows 1st January 2023. Across the world it will be rolled out. A new car comes in, within three to six months it is in India. Indian customer is not willing to wait. To require a global presence and product life cycles are becoming shorter. So you have to constantly renew your new product. Look at the number of 
smartphones or mobile phones, all of us have used in the last five years. Now, this requires a lot of investment in R&D. So R&D costs are going up and the intensity of R&D is going up. In initially, developed nations like US, Europe, Japan, and the companies established there used to invest in R&D and come up with new products, new technologies. But today, the technological capability in the world has increased. There's a kind of technology leveling which is taking place. There are multiple geographical or organization sources of technology. When we talked about the aircraft, we talked about Airbus and those kind of companies. But today, Brazil has an embedded. And then they sell embedded across the world. Indian Air Force has an embedded, Indian Air India has an embedded. This is a scientification of new technologies. Up till now, new products were based on the known principles of science and engineering. But with latest developments in new technologies, biotechnology, nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, the new products are based on the emerging science. So you do not have today all the abilities in-house in any company. So you need to complement the internal R&D with an external technology. Now that external technology again is on a global basis. So wherever the technology is available. Today we talk about China being lowest cost producer and that is a competition for us. But from R&D perspective worldwide, challenge is not from low cost producers, but from low cost innovators. People who can innovate at a lower budget quickly. Indians work under the constraints. So Indian engineers do not have luxury of the resources at their command, technical, financial. So they do constant optimization. Sometimes it is also being called jugar. It is not the jugar. G has found out in medical devices, Indian capabilities are able to produce devices at a low cost and very functional. So G has decided to set up their global R&D for medical devices in Bangalore. So all these companies want a quick access to these growing global sources of innovation. And once they have their sources access, they want to rapidly integrate it, the new knowledge and technology into the products. They have wherewithal, infrastructure, and systems to convert any new idea into a product quickly. But they realize they do not have monopoly over ideas. So they are looking at that source of knowledge. So what is happening is the emergence of new global R&D paradigm. It is not only the business has got globalized, but today even R&D has become globalized. And globalization is taking around centers of excellence. We always talk about Boston because there's a Harvard, there's a MIT there. But today there's a Bangalore. This is a technopolis. We have Indian Institute of Science, we have National Aerospace Laboratory, we have ISRO, we have Gas Turbine Establishment, number of R&D institutions. Now, globalization of R&D is taking around those centers of excellence. Bangalore has a few hundreds of R&D centers of multinational companies. And institutions which always thought their job is to transfer technology a one-way street, they are themselves becoming a learning organization because technology does not flow in one way. It also comes from outside. What is happening is Self-organizing innovation networks are forming on a need basis. So academic institutions, where as an academicians, we were in our ivory towers, we are changing and adopting their entrepreneurial culture. That is the reason today 
we are setting up an incubation center with academic institutions. So this is basically a technology business incubation. What has happened? Companies have moved away from funding discovery research, new science. They prefer to buy technologies which are proven, or they want to buy startups who own them. And startup companies which are founded on the basis of the academic research or government research, today are offering an alternative route for funding the research and technology commercialization. Instead of funding academic or research institutions, companies are willing to invest in startups to guide them and commercialize the technology and once successful, you can acquire them or have a and of a supplier relationship. So there's a widespread use of incubators and entrepreneurial innovation policy across the world. Business incubators are leading instrument used by United States and Europe to facilitate technology transfer from public research organizations, including economics. When you talk about academic and research institutions and startups there, a lot of commercial risks there, rather than a technical risk, because these ventures are established by scientists or technical professionals, but very often they lack the other skills, business skills, financial skills, market skills, regulatory skills. And this is where the incubator comes in. The objective of setting up any incubator is to support high technology industry by supporting novice entrepreneurs at the earliest stage of their technological entrepreneurship. To encourage new science based industries, technologies which did not exist, they are premature. And they will get into a new products, new applications to encourage them to create new employment opportunities for technologically skilled persons. There is a time we had a heavy brain drain because highly qualified people did not have opportunity, did not have opportunity to work at the cutting edge of science and technology. So incubators provide support and protect environment to individual inventors and entrepreneurs for the development of their technology into a kind of business ventures. What does the incubator actually offer? It offers facilities for R&D, even at a low rent. At IIT Bombay, in our incubator at Sun, sometimes we even defer those low rents. We provide central administrative services, secretarial accounting, legal, management and technical assistance, business and professional guidance, assistance in commercialization. Basically, we want technical people to focus on their technology development. The rest is provided. That is what the incubator does. And once you are an incubator, you learn from other startups. So there's an interest, tenant synergism. You learn about new technologies, new markets, you learn about complementary technologies. And then you also get a financial support in the form of seed capital, angel investors, venture capitalists, and also you get connected to potential customer partners. So advantage of incubation are inventors retain the control of technology, which they would lose if they initially sell out. Labs or institutions and inventors will increase the winning. Inventors focus on technology. There are mentors who provide the guidance. And there are additional assistance from other service providers which are hired by the incubators. And most important job which incubators do. By supporting the startups in the local economic development. If there are startups, when they graduate, they do a next scale of production the local economic development which takes job gets created 
Let me tax this. That's what you plan it. That's one of the inputs. So if you look at incubator, it's an organization that boosts a process to support the excellent growth of venture into a successful enterprise with an integrated service model. The world has been borrowed from medical sciences. When there's a premature baby born, you put it in an incubator under the control condition of a temperature and light so that it survives for a few weeks. So a business incubator is a facility for the maintenance of that control condition which assists in the cultivation of new company. The incubator program is basically primary manufacturer of startups. A lot of people mistake facility for training, testing, and so on. But it is basically the job of incubator to manufacture startups. Over the period of time, I have seen four generation incubators. The first generation was there is a flexible workplace and common services. A number of tenants in this. The software technology parks of India, which were established 30 years before, they basically provided infrastructure support. They were the first generation incubator. Then we had a second generation entrepreneur, where in addition to the first generation services, they provided an enterprise incubation service. So they were kind of business parks. The job was to give a management support. Then there are the third generation entrepreneurs where you also got a focus on technology and markets. And there was the involvement of research institutions. It was an innovation parks where basically a technology support came in. Then we have four generation of entrepreneurs currently, uh, incubators currently. There is a close involvement from investors and industry. The venture creation covering the full chain of knowledge generation, application exploitation. As we go forward, we're going to see a fifth generation of incubators, which will manage the function of business incubator and all other instruments. Science and technology park, technology transfer offices of institutions, venture fund companies, venture capital funds. Although capacity, networks, and goals are different, instrument needed to be different, but you will see the integration of all this, which is going to emerge. If I were to look at the success factor, there are a few factors I want to point out based on my experience and what I've seen. One is diligence on intellectual property is absolutely critical. See, the only differentiator of a startup from established companies or other competitors in intellectual property. Otherwise, the startups will develop something, and the established companies who have all the infrastructure will be quickly able to replicate, thereby killing startups. So the startups only strong point is going to be this intellectual property with which they will be able to exclude the existing players. Let us look at a case in two wheelers. Today we are talking about electric vehicles. All of you heard of a company called Ether, which has come up with smart vehicle. Now, once it comes with the smart vehicles, a company like Bajaj Auto, which was the world's largest producer of two wheelers, which has all the infrastructure, production infrastructure, money, because Bajaj Finance is a cash rich company, marketing. Service centers. Bajaj Auto has service center in every part of the country. They can quickly replicate Ether and kill the Ether in the market. But that has not happened. And the Bajaj announced Chetak Electric will come. But Chetak Electric has yet to make a mark. And Ether has close to 60 patents in their armor. So, diligence and IP is absolutely critical. There has to be a solid business plan, which is essential from R&D right up to regulatory. Because a lot of industry at the end is controlled by regulation. 
in automobile, there are regulations, pharmaceutical, there are regulations, cosmetic, there are regulations, biotechnology, there are regulations. So you have to think through all, not only a product, the certification reaching the market. You also have to look at inventors, current and future projects. Some inventors are involved in number of activities. What is the commitment? Also to understand inventors' motivation and expectation. What I find is, based on the current success of few unicorns, many startups are just looking, working for a couple of years, then waiting to be sold off and just making money. I have startup by the students who are in the fourth year of engineering, and they're already talking about valuation. And all they have is a product which they just made a first prototype in the lab, which still has to go to the user trial. But these are the kind of motivation to the young people have. Then you understand investors' motivation. What is the long term plan of the investors? How long they want to get invested? And what are their expectations? So, communication with all the stakeholders is a key. And then you must leverage institutional resources to the extent possible. Not only your institution, but there are a large number of institutions outside you, and they have resources which you can use. While I'm on this, I would like to clarify because today, we talk about a startup. So everybody who wants to do a business saying, I have a startup. Somebody wants to develop an app, he's saying, I have a startup. Somebody is basically trading into it, but he's just an e commerce website, he's saying, I have a startup. In the context of technology and innovation, let me explain to you what a startup means. You have an early stage technology. Their outcomes are still undetermined. You have some potential. And the proof of concept is yet to be demonstrated. You still don't have products is economically viable. And you require a continuous involvement of inventory because the product is yet to be developed. No market or little market exists because it's an entirely new product which was never existing. You're not replacing an existing product. So market will have to be developed. Legal or other changes will be required to enable adoption. Let us look at something like Ola and Uber. They had to work with government to change RTO rules. The RTO rules only permitted those auto rickshaw and taxis to operate. It did not permit anybody else to operate a taxi service. It took Ola and Uber nearly a year to get the rules changed. So very often, legal and other changes will be required for everything. And established players are unlikely to take risks. When people are established, very often they don't want to lose money. They don't want to enter the uncharted territory of technology and markets. And most important part is inventors themselves are interested in taking innovation to the market. That commitment, that emotional involvement, develop and take it to the market. This is what all the startup is. So, my prescription is limit supported technological RD with practical commercial potential and with a limited incubation term of three to five years. And after that, they must move into a regular business environment. You also should look at potential to grow in a relatively short period of time and employ the skilled workers. Because our job is to create high quality jobs. Once high quality jobs get created, tertiary employment will happen. And you must closely involve students and research fellows. They must acquire those skills. So nurture the innovation potential of individuals in the population at large. That is one of the important objective, we must keep it in mind. Then comes the issue, what are, where are the opportunities? I find a lot of startups, people have started and they fail because they have not understood customer requirements. They feel this is what the market needs, but market doesn't think. 
that they need that. Perspective of a customer, a user is entirely different. So selecting the right opportunity is the most important thing. So actually innovation begins with a conscious search for innovation opportunities. And Peter Rucker has said, these opportunities can be categorized but cannot be predicted. Finding the opportunity and exploiting them with a focused practical solution requires a disciplined work. This was again Peter Rucker in one of his Harvard Business Studio article. So let us look at how do you identify opportunities. In our technological entrepreneurship class, we teach them there are three ways to identify an opportunity. Observing trends, solving a problem, and finding gap in the marketplace. When we talk about observing trends, we talk about economic trends, social trends, technological advances, political action, regulatory changes. So each of them create opportunities for entrepreneurship pursuit. Solving a problem. Sometimes identifying opportunities simply involves noticing a problem and finding a way to solve it. Now, those problems you can pinpoint through observed trends, or maybe intuition, serendipity. The best thing is going to the customer, looking at the people who have problems. What is happening today? When we talk about a competition, competition is not between companies. Competition is not between the products. Globally, it is a competition with the skills. The skills are the most important asset which you have. Market drives value from the company through those skills. Products are transient mechanism through which you drive the value. And company drives value from the market through those products, and vice versa. And product life cycles are becoming shorter and shorter. I made a reference to how many number of phones we have changed in the last five years. Look at consumer electronics. Look at laptops. Any product you see. Product life cycle is becoming shorter and shorter. But the skill life cycle is becoming longer and longer. So it's longer time to acquire those skills. And today, when every product is a multi-technology product, look at your phone, the number of technology which are embedded in it, you young people buy a phone for the camera. So it is an amazing technology there. There's electronics there, there's the internet there, there's a sound technology there, number of technologies which are embedded in it. And now each of those technologies are growing at a very fast pace. So today, no company can acquire all their skills in house and keep it in house. You can focus on a few key capabilities which you have. Rest you to acquire from outside. There was a time when we talked about a technology transfer. We talked about a know how, show how, and turnkey solutions. But today, that is not the case. There are individual components of knowledge which have acquired value. So there is a market for those knowledge units. And those units are capitalizable and adaptable. So what we are seeing is emergence of those knowledge markets deal with intellectual capital. And when there is a market, there are customers, buyers, and sellers. In the case of knowledge, we have a symmetric market, inefficient market. But the suppliers didn't know who the customers are, customers didn't know suppliers. But internet commerce today enables, like all other markets, knowledge markets also to be more efficient. And it offers a lot of opportunities and benefits. 
is freedom for participation. Anybody can participate. An individual can participate, a corporate can participate. An exploitation of intellectual property is open to all. And like all other fields, redefines the role of intermediaries. There is a travel agent today. The fellow who used to buy tickets for us. Then we buy train tickets, plane tickets directly. We don't go to an agent. Real estate, our people are there, but magic bricks and those kind of things have redefined their own. You have better market access today. You can precisely match the requirements and the supply. There's a transparency, there's no opacity there. And today, because of this, collaborative knowledge generation is possible. People used to talk about what is return on investment. Today we are talking about return on knowledge. So what is happening? There are e-knowledge markets which are emerging. Outsource innovation. Companies want to gain access to increasing pool of knowledge and creativity is available. Chief Executive of Procter and Gamble said, "I have 3,000 engineers outside." world is 3 million. Why I am dependent only on my 3,000 people? Why can't I tap those 3 million? There are solutions which are already existing, maybe for a different purpose. Can I we tap into the existing solutions? So there are a number of such initiatives which have successfully worked now for more than a decade. A website called yet2.com. It is made by Fortune 500 companies who are active in R&D field. They do a lot of research. They have IP. A lot of IP they don't use. They license and use IP. There are a lot of technological problems. They put out those problems there, soliciting potential technology. And these are our problems, can you solve us? And this opportunities to discover alliances in the people who are in competition, but in the non-competitive sector. And these problem statements are open. You can go to yet2.com and see in every different field, different companies have posed the problem. And you can offer a solution. Startups are welcome. It is clearly written. There are times where people write that we will only work with startup. Innocente. It was initially an inter division of Eli Lilly, which is a pharmaceutical company. This division used to look at external sources of knowledge for Eli Lilly. They became successful. They were spun out as a separate company. And they pose chemistry, biology, engineering problem for anyone to solve for a cash reward. Problems are given. Then what kind of solution required? How they will be evaluated? And anybody can offer a solution. The best solution is selected. An award is given. Award is upfront mentioned. Saying you'll get hundred thousand dollar, you'll get fifty thousand dollar, ten thousand dollar, whatever it is. A lot of freelancers participate. I told it. Let me tell you, we are not a research laboratory. We are born into information. But we won awards five times. Because based on available knowledge, looking at the data discovery, we generated information and data. This is Nine Sigma, another company which pre qualifies institutions. Like an NCL, they pre qualified us for polymer and some other areas. So anytime any of the member companies give a problem for polymers, they'll convert the need into a request for proposal and send that request for proposal to me and such shortlisted people. And this creates much of efficiency in outsourcing, evaluate those proposals. And I can go on. There are a number of such websites, portals. 
Today, it has become so successful that companies have their own portals. You can go and see a Unilever portal. You can go and see a General Mills portal. You can go and see Cadbury's portal. That is Mondelez, company named for Cadbury's Mondelez. Procter & Gamble. So today, a number of companies are openly saying these are our problems. Can you solve them? All these are opportunities to be solved. I even tell, even at NCL, I used to say, I say even if you are not submitting a solution, this is an excellent real-life problem to work, and that can be used to give a training to students how to do a research, how to solve a problem. Recently at IIT Dharwar, I gave a team a problem posed by NASA. Last year, I connected one of this company, which was a wind energy company, to a com startup which was working in robotics. Problem. So there's a one. The another initiative, there's a company called Intellectual Venture, which was founded by few of the ex Microsoft people, Nathan and Jung and of Intel. They raised more than $10 billion from large companies like Intel, Sony, Nokia, Apple, Google. And they hired prominent scientists to perform inventions. The names were kind of Nobel laureate kind of people, Robert Langer and so many. Their whole business model revolved around the idea the unit of asset is an invention rather than a company. And they started purchasing patents and inventions. Later on, they were accused that they are only being patent trolls, so they opened a laboratory. There's a lot of wonderful work invented a fundamental new kind of nuclear reactor. There are 40,000 patent applications filed. There are German banks who patent politicization. They look at patent as an asset. You have a house, you mortgage your house, you take a loan. You mortgage your car, then you take a loan. But here, seven financial institutions, an IP expert, developed a methodology to evaluate patent value. And that methodology was audited by KPMG, which is one of the management firms. And government tax authority in Germany accepts this valuation. Financial institutions and banks are granting low cannabis patents. Anybody interested, they can go and look at IB, AG, what I written here, and get a more details. There are patent funds. We talk about the mutual funds in the country, and we have theme-based funds. There are five active funds in Germany based on patents. Swiss Bank has two, Swiss Bank has one. And these are trading funds and incubating funds. They buy patents and leverage, so they generate return for the investor. Primarily in the emerging technology, biotechnology, renewables, electronic medical devices. They do licensing, so on. The company called Ocean Tomo in US, basically an IP consulting group of 500. But they created a private equity advisory partnership for investment based on intellectual capital. And their investment banking practice was dedicated exclusively to patent based structure finance. And they created U.S. first integrated intellectual capital merchant bank. There are a small firm called Patent Ratings, which was based on a patent to value a patent. So there are 50 attributes on this. They acquired that company and created first index based on the value of intellectual capital. So they have Ocean Tomo 300 patent index, which they launched on the American Stock Exchange. And this index has done much more than standard, and grown much faster than standard poor index. And these people established live public auction marketplace for intellectual property. There are a number of auctions in Europe. Every year. I was surprised. Once even NASA put a portfolio of 10 patents, I never imagined a government research agency will go to a public auction through a private firm, but they went. 
last time I saw they had a portfolio of pattern on online voting. They said when this becomes commercialized, none of us will go to a polling booth. Everybody in the world will vote from their home. This is a pattern insurance. You can get an insurance for the infringement of patent or even a liability, defense and offensive. The way you get insurance for other things. Some of the companies, predominantly USA, UK, who offer you patent insurance. And all these knowledge markets are becoming globalized. What I'm telling you is not what is there abroad. Yet2.com has an Indian consultant for Indian market. He's an Indian who previously used to work for DuPont. Innocento.com gets largest submissions from India, particularly in chemistry and pharmaceuticals. Nine Sigma is represented in India by the Inventor Association. Intellectual Venture has an office in Bangalore. Their chairman was a former director of IIT Bombay, which missed up. Imperial Innovation, the most successful company of Imperial College, has a company in India, again based in Bangalore. And Bangalore had a live similar cost of Ocean Tomo's auction way back in 2008. So today, companies that are hit by pandemic are basically storing up their performance by squeezing money from intellectual property rights and knowledge. All these big companies have startup programs. Intel has a startup program. This is based in Bangalore. Qualcomm has a startup program in India. Tata's, the Tata Universe, an open innovation platform where Tata Group companies pose their problems. Like Innocentive, they pose it, put the rewards. I think currently seventh or eighth round is going on. You can have a look at it. Reliance as a program to incubate startups, accelerate. Previously they had court, now continuously they are accepting applications. Marico, a consumer product company. Supports startups, incubator. So, again, large number of people are there. I'm just giving you a few illustrations. Companies have realized that they need to co create products and services with customers and integrate customer into product practice. And the rate of change outside is so high. Then they're changed internally. If they don't do this, they'll not survive. That is what Jack Will says. And the rate of change outside of is greater than the change inside, the end is near. So open innovation is today enabled by social app, the idea generation, crowdsourcing, idea markets, challenge events, co-design, co-development. And there's a cultural shift. Previously, people were Close. They only looked at in-house. Company like DuPont, for 200 year history, everything was based on in-house. But all of them are looking out. They are willing to say innovation idea that are new to us, not necessary which were developed from internally. And com our company advantage is design and execution, not just ideas. Ideas can come from anywhere. So people are willing to look at outside ideas, depending on startups. It is not only a private sector, even government initiatives. You talked about Atmanirbha Bharat in introduction. Government creates regular hackathons. All departments of government every year get saying give us your problem statements. All those problem states are collected by all departments and ministries. They are curated. And what government think important. And the hackathons are conducted. And people who succeed in hackathon not only get money 
to develop their ideas. But government said, if you succeed, we'll do preferential purchase. We'll incorporate into our government procurement system. Even this has been open to defense. So you might have seen advertisements of DRDO exhibitions, seminars, where DRDO says these are our defense needs. Come and participate. Then there is Atal Innovation Yojana, where incubator is being funded. There is a Startup India program in so much, which is everything is in public domain. So all this offers an opportunity. You don't have to fail because opportunities have been identified. Put your technical skill. So open innovation is harnessing the power of the crowd. Be part of it. And be part of the e knowledge markets, which are global. And succeed. Thank you. With this, I'll stop here. And thank you once again for inviting me. Thank you so much, sir, for such an informative session. Yes, now, I would like to invite Shri Mahesh Athavle, sir, the vice chairman of Governing Body and Council, Deccan Education Society, to give a vision note on Business Incubator. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, I must uh, appreciate the inputs given by Dr. Hirwani. And he has really guided us and he has shown us the way ahead what we should do as an incubation center and how do we motivate students and how do we capitalize on the innovation. Now, um, what I would like to share with the participants is uh, why we have started this and what exactly we want to do. In a way, that is vision statement. Our vision is very simple. Rather than job seekers, we would like our products, if I may use that word, job givers. What we observe is that there is a tremendous potential in the students and uh, people uh, are full of uh, innovative ideas and what is re required is proper forum needs to be made available to them and we have to nurture that, we have to help them out, we have to guide them, including financial, technical, commercial support and this is perhaps uh, uh, the way ahead for us. So. It is, it is proposed that uh, Dr. P.C. Shazwalkar, who was a founder of IMDR, and of course a life member of uh, Deccan Education Society and a vice principal of Commerce College, BMCC. He had a vision that our youngsters should always think of something new, out of box, and we as a facilitator should provide the student, uh, we should help him to convert his idea into a commercial venture. If we are able to do that, perhaps we would uh, be serving not only uh, the college, the society, or that particular student, but uh, at macro level, I may say, and in line with what Dr. Hirwani mentioned, that uh, we will be contributing a bit in the efforts of our uh, government, our uh, honorable beloved prime minister, uh, and there are umpteen number of opportunities. And one never knows which idea will catch up and how investors would respond to that. I remember when there was a Y2K problem, uh, the Y2K companies flourished like anything, but unfortunately it proved to be a bubble. So it could happen. And I, I don't have a specific statistics with me, but I'm told that uh, uh, out of uh, nine ideas or 10 ideas, eight would, may fail, but two will give you the yield, the kind of returns which perhaps you might have spent on nurturing those 10 ideas. So that could happen. So with the guidance of uh, dignitaries and experts like uh, Dr. Hirwani and uh, luckily Ferguson College and IMDR is full of uh, uh, rich uh, heritage and uh, their alumni is very strong. And we already have received a lot of positive feedback and our uh, students who are now well settled in their own career they have come forward and they have offered whatever we want them to do for this uh, exercise. And it's going to be a success story. I'm confident about it. The team which is working at Ferguson and IMDR is geared up. 
so uh, in fact uh, the other day we concluded that innovation uh, uh, competition and happy that uh, we have received very positive response uh, for a couple of ideas so it's a good beginning and an auspicious day like makar sankranti and sankraman means a transformation so i'm sure with this kind of a activity which uh, deccan education society has undertaken we would try to bring transformation in the approach in the attitude in the perception in the thinking process of our products uh, and as i said that uh, let them start uh, doing something on their own let them be entrepreneurs let them come out with innovative ideas and therefore i would say this is a, a different kind of a combination where ferguson uh, which has a science and arts faculty and imdr which has a management faculty and for a business you need technology and you need commercial wisdom and management uh, expertise so this would be a good uh, combination and with this combination we propose to take this forward to a greater heights uh, for the information of all we have uh, let me also mention that we have already written to the central government for a grant but whether we get a grant or not we as a deccan education society we have decided that we will go ahead and certain funds have been earmarked for this activity and now unfortunately we were to launch this today but for this uh, corona restrictions we could not do it but then um, with this uh, webinar and uh, words of wisdom from dr hirwani i am sure that uh, the team which is already uh, ignited now they will give uh, further thoughts and your presentation was excellent sir and um, i really appreciate the contents and we will uh, think and we will try to implement and uh, as and when we need your further guidance we would certainly come back to you and i am sure your uh, support your blessings would be always available uh, to us so with this few words uh, i would conclude and wish uh, all the best to this uh, dr pc shezwalkar center for innovation and entrepreneurship and uh, let me also compliment everybody all organizers of this uh, webinar and i must express my gratitude to dr hirwani thank you very much back to the organizers thank you sir i am always available to help the yeah. students and contribute whatever i can do it all i want to <laughs> yes. say all i want to say is today baner and bawdan have become a hub of startups for deccan gym khana was always the center of the city and fc was always a hub of educational activity whether on the left hand side right from focus and or across the hill to the symbiosis or on the right hand side of the progress education society till the aissms so let us now push to shift the center of gravity to back to the deccan gym khana thank you thank you sir for your wise words now i would like to invite ms sukruta kulkarni to give a vote of thanks thank you somya respected dr sharad kunte sir chairman governing body and council deccan education society pune shri mahesh athavle sir vice chairman governing body and council des pune dr ravindra singh pradeshi sir principal ferguson college pune Vice Principal Professor Swati Joglekar Ma'am and Dr. Nitin Kulkarni Sir, Director Dr. Shikha Jain Ma'am, I Sukruta Kulkarni am honored and privileged to get an opportunity to propose a vote of thanks on this special occasion. I, on behalf of Deccan Education Society (PC) Shezwalkar's Incubation Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, convey deep regards and hearty thanks to Dr. Raj Hirwani Sir. Emeritus Professor A A C S I R and former Director of U R D I P C S I R for being the speaker of the event Innovation Incubation and E Knowledge Markets. I am extremely thankful to our Principal Dr. Pradeshi Sir for his constant support and encouragement. I feel deep sense of gratitude towards Dr. Sharad Kunte Sir, Sri Mahesh Athavle Sir. the entire deccan education society and all those who have been so hortative in establishing this center i also thank dr anil keskar sir for joining this session well an event like this cannot happen overnight it requires planning and a discerning eye for details we have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of immensely driven dedicated professors of ferguson college and imdr 
I also thank the entire teaching and non teaching staff who have directly and indirectly helped us to make this event successful. Dr. Uh, Raj Hirwani, sir, thank you so much. I mean, in such an organic way, you told us what entrepreneurship is and how uh, you, you should start a business and most importantly, in a very application based manner. So we feel so fortunate to imbibe this knowledge from you, sir. And uh, just one thing I wanted to add here, I, I, I just can't um, resist myself to saying this. I can see the background here with lots of books uh, behind you and I am inspired by this. I'm awestruck by this and I someday I just feel that uh, in the future I could be there with this kind of background. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Namaskar. Namaskar, sir. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank, Thank you. Much.